Good morning. Um, so I'm coming to you again from my temporary home office here in the playroom at my house. Um, I hope that everything is going well for you guys out there. Hello. Um, so I want to tell you before I kind of dig into this that I've really enjoyed doing these studies. It's been nice to, um, to do something a little bit different. I, I really enjoy teaching um, from a book. I really enjoy teaching at an adult level. And it's been nice to kind of communicate with a group of people that I haven't gotten to teach in a class. Um, really, <clears throat> since I started uh, working full-time at Chattahoochee Valley, um, I hope that one day I will be able to teach an adult class. And hey, Diane. Um, I hope that one day I'll be able to teach an adult class, and I, I think it'll be kind of fun for all of us. It's a lot of fun for me to answer these questions myself, but man, wouldn't it be cool to have a real discussion about them? I hope that you have people you can discuss this stuff with. Hey, hey, Bob and Peg, how are you guys? Um, but as it is, things are okay. So um, just to kind of begin a discussion that I'll continue over for the next few weeks with you guys, um, the elders and I have spent a whole lot of time this week, I mean, in the three to four hour range now, talking about plans to reopen Chattahoochee Valley Church. And we'll go further into it in... Uh, Sorry, I think Don is sending the email this week. Don will go further into detail into it when he emails everybody on Friday. But, um, hey, Maureen and Buddy, how are you guys? But suffice it to say, we're not quite ready to reopen yet. Um, there's a lot of discernment going on that is coming, hopefully, from a prayerful mindset. <clears throat> and from uh, a place in our hearts where we're trying to submit ourselves fully to God so that we can make a, a right decision that is that is best um, in, in the Lord's eyes for how to carry on in this moment. But for now, we feel like we're not quite ready. Um, I should say, we as individuals would love to be together. I think we are ready. We do not think that um, the situation in the world and in Columbus, Georgia is quite ready. And for those of you who are wondering how we're arriving at that, um, a whole lot of our decision making is coming from simply asking Scott how many hospital beds are open at St. Francis. Kurt said the wisest thing we could do is make sure there's enough to hold us. And if there were, then it's okay for us to get back together. But if there's not, perhaps we should wait until there's enough space to take care of us if we are to get sick. Anyway, more on that at another time. Good morning to, the, uh, to Tina and to everybody else who's here with me now. So today I'm going to be going through James 4, verses 1 through 12. Um, and so I will be reading from the NIV i got my, my big serendipity Bible here. Um, and then I'm going to go through kind of the Warren Wiersbe chapter on this and talk about it. I'm going to read some of it to you, and then I'll ask some questions at the end that hopefully you guys get some spiritual gain from. So let's start with James 4, 1 through 12. This section is actually titled Submit Yourselves to God, which I think is pertinent to what I was talking about a moment ago. So what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he, ca he caused to live in us envies intensely? But he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You're double minded, you double minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? Okay, so when I first read through this again yesterday, I couldn't help but thinking, man, that sounds that sounds really heavy. <laughs> um it's kind of scary, actually, to think about how we uh, separate ourselves from God and how much kind of danger that can bring into our lives. And I guess when Wearsby read this, he had the exact same thoughts as me. So I'm using Warren Wearsby's Be Mature. It's from the 
extensive collection of Buddy Jones that was left to me. Hey, Sarah Randolph. Um, tell Tim and children I said hi. And anyway, so he, he titles this section How to End Wars, which I think is interesting because the first time I read it, I wasn't thinking about war in the sense that he's going to use it here. I was thinking about myself, but more on that later. So I'm going to read through this. So I'm going to do a lot of reading here for a moment, but I want you to hear this because I think it's better than, um, <clears throat> than what kind of my own thoughts were. So James discussed the important theme of war in this paragraph. And he explained that there are three wars going on in the world. There's really three separate wars that are being fought at all times. The first is that we are at war with each other. So James says, what causes fights and quarrels among you, among Christians? Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brother, brethren to dwell together in unity. That's from Psalms 133.1. That's what we should be doing. We should be dwelling together in unity. Surely brethren should live together in love and harmony, and yet often they do not. Even the disciples created problems for the Lord when they argued over who was the greatest in the kingdom. And we see that in Luke 9, 46 through 48. So James really points out several different kinds of disagreements that are among the Christians. And I want to go through these. There's three or four of them if you're the kind of person that likes to take notes. The first are class wars. And we saw him talk about that at great length in uh, 2, 1 through 9. And, you know, if you go back and look at that, it's kind of uses the rich and the poor as an, the rich and the poor as an example of judgment. If fellowship in a church depends on such external things as clothing and economic status, then the church is out of the will of God. The second thing that he talks about is employment wars. We're going to see this in James 5, so I'm not going to really go into it now, but just suffice it to say, class wars are rich versus poor. Employment wars kind of work the exact same way when we judge those who have what we believe to be low or base um, employment versus those who we believe to have like high or important employment, and we create a distinction between the two. We are sinning. The third type of war that we fight against each other are church fights. So essentially, apparently the believers James wrote to were at war with each other over positions in the church, many of them wanting to be teachers and leaders. And go back to verse 3, 1, and you see a warning about being a teacher. James is trying to tell this group of people, look, this isn't for everybody. Each person thought that his ideas were the only right ideas, and his ways the only right ways. Selfish ambition ruled their meetings, not spiritual submission. And the fourth type of war that we have with each other is what he, he calls a personal war here. When I read that initially, I thought, oh, personal war means war within oneself, but no, it doesn't. Personal war is a war, a war between two people, like a, an argument between two in, unique individuals. So the saints, the Christians, were speaking evil of one another and judging one another. Christians are to speak the truth in love, which is from Ephesians 4.15. They are not to speak evil in a spirit of rivalry and criticism. If the truth about a brother is harmful, then we should cover it in love and not repeat it. That's from 1 Peter 4.8. If he has sinned, we should go to him personally and try to win him back. And that's kind of repeated in Matthew 18.15-19 and Galatians 6.1-2. Christians need to have discernment, which we've talked about constantly for the last couple of weeks. You saw Buddy's uh, sermon. Buddy and I have literally spent hours on the phone talking about how to discern things for the future of the church. There's, there's no light decisions being made right now. Everything we've done, everything that you've heard from us, every word that I've said, every word that Buddy has said, every email you've sent has come after hours and hours and hours of prayer and thought. And there are hours more to come, I hope. <laughs> but so we Christians need to have discernment. But we must not act like God in passing our judgment. We must first examine our own lives and then try to help others, which we remember from Matthew 7, 1 through 5. So to speak evil of a brother and to judge a brother on the basis of partial evidence and probably unkind motives is to sin against him and against God. And I think we have a hard time with that sometimes. So in John 17, 21, <clears throat> we actually see Jesus pray that, that all, they all, all of his followers may be as one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And Jesus talks about Christian unity. In this case, because he wants us to be able to um, show others the light of Christ. When we're fighting with one another, people outside of the Christian realm, people outside of church, see us fighting and go, they don't love each other. They're telling me that God is love and that it's all about forgiveness, but it's clear that they don't want love one another from their personal fights. 
Okay, so the first type of war is at war with each other. The second type of war is being at war with ourselves. The war in the heart is helping to cause the wars in the church. To jump back into James 3. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. The essence of sin is selfishness. I'm going to read kind of a bit here, but I really like the way he worded it. Often we veil our religious quarrels under the disguise of spirituality. We are like Miriam and Aaron, who complained about Moses' wife, but who really were envious of Moses' authority. It's from Numbers 12. Or we imitate James and John, who asked for special thrones in the kingdom, when what they really wanted was recognition today. Mark 10, 35-45. In both of these instances, the result of selfish desire was chastening and division among God's people. Miriam's sin... Miriam's sin halted the progress of Israel for a whole week. Selfish desires are a dangerous thing. They lead to wrong actions. We see in James 4, verse 2, which we just read, you kill, you fight, and you are at war. And they even lead to wrong praying. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. It's from verse 3 we read a moment ago. When our praying is wrong, our whole Christian life is wrong. It has been said that the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth. Thou shalt not covet is the last of God's ten commandments, but its violation can make us break all the other nine. Covetousness can make a person kill, tell lies, dishonor his parents, commit adultery, and in one way or another, violate all of God's moral law. Selfish living and selfish praying also always, always lead to war. If there is war on the inside, there will ultimately be war on the outside. Sometimes we even use prayer as a cloak to hide our true desires. But I prayed about it can be one of the biggest excuses a Christian can use. Instead of seeking God's will, we tell God what he is supposed to do, and we get angry at him if he does not obey. Okay. And that's inside of ourselves. And I thought I would just read that to you because it makes a lot of sense to me. So if the first word we have is with each other, the second word we have is with ourselves, the third word we have is with God. The root cause of every war, internal and external, is rebellion against God. As we see in 1 John 3, 4, sin is lawlessness, and lawlessness is rebellion against God. So how does a believer declare war against God? I don't think many people are like, come at me, God, let's fight. No, it's by being friendly with God's enemies. Wiersbe lists off um, three enemies that we need to consider at all times, and he pulls these from the verses I read a minute ago. So the first enemy is the world. And by the world, James means, of course, human society apart from God. I want to elaborate a little bit more on what that means. So so what is the world that we talked about here? What does it mean to be human society apart from God? God is unlimited. God is infinite. God is everywhere. But God created us with free will. And God gave us choice. And God gives inside of us a mind to think. So what is human society? Well, what we were talking about just a minute ago. When we separate ourselves from God and we say, I can do these things on my own, I'm going to create things that I believe are better than what God has created, we, we create the world. A couple weeks ago, I talked about false idols and the light of God being real truth and that there is no light of man, there is no other light, it's only darkness. Well, in that darkness, we do create things. It's not hard to look around the world and see things that were definitely not in God's original design that have been that he's allowed to, for humans to make. When we do those things, when we take part in that society, we are apart from God. Okay. The whole system of things in the society of ours is anti-Christ and anti-God. Abraham was the friend of God. Lot was the friend of the world. Lot ended up in a war, and Abraham had to rescue him. A Christian gets involved with the world gradually. Like I said a moment ago, I, I genuinely don't believe there are many people that are like, today I choose evil. I think most people slowly get involved with the world without realizing it. First, there is the friendship of the world. And this results in being spotted by the world so that areas of our lives meet with the approval of the world. Friendship with the world leads to loving the world. And this makes it easy to conform to the world, which we see in Romans 12 too. The sad result is being condemned with the world. Our souls saved yet as by fire, which is from 1 Corinthians 3. Friendship with the world is compared to adultery. And I really like this, this image. The believer is married to Christ and not to be faithful to him. 
But when we choose the world over our relationship with Christ, we are adulterous. We see many warnings about adultery um, in the New Testament. They're all kind of related back to this idea. Okay. The second way that we are at war with God is through the flesh, which again connects directly to that adultery idea I mentioned a moment ago. And by the flesh, it is meant that the old nature that we inherited from Adam that is prone to sin, the flesh is not the human body. The human body is benign. It's neutral. The spirit may use the body to glorify God, may use the body, but the flesh, the flesh may use the body to serve sin. When a sinner yields to Christ, he receives a new nature within. But the old nature is neither removed nor reformed. For this reason, there is a battle within. Galatians 5.17 says, For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. So this is what James, James termed your lusts that are in your members in James 4.1 in the King James Version. Living to please the old nature means to declare war against God. The carnal mind is enmity against God. To allow the flesh to control the mind is to lose the blessing of the fellowship with God. And the final way that we are at war with God, the final, sorry, the final enemy um, of God that causes us to be at war with God is, is the devil, just very directly. And the biggest sin that we're pulled to from Satan, uh, the one that we first see him introduce is pride. Pride is Satan's great sin. And it is one of his chief weapons in warfare against the saint and the savior. God wants us to be humble. Satan wants us to be proud. You will be like God, Satan promised Eve, and she believed him. God wants us to depend on his grace, while the devil wants us to depend on ourselves. Man has nothing to be proud of in himself. There dwells no good thing in us, it's from Romans 7:18. But when we trust Christ, he puts that good thing in us to make us his children. So now what? We know that we're at war with each other, at war with ourselves, and at war with God. So what is James trying to get us to see? Well, three things, starting at verse 7. The three ways, the three instructions to follow if we want peace instead of war. The first is submit to God. Submit to God. So the word submit is an interesting one. It's essentially when you submit to something, you, you in your humility, realize that you are not the one in power. Everyone who's ever been in the army has had to submit to somebody higher than them. And even the president has to submit to a concept, the United States Constitution. The president can't just go and create his own new rules based entirely on what he wants to do. There's no one inside of the structure of the U.S. military that is not submitting to some higher authority. And they allow that because when they don't, it doesn't work. We are all submitting to something in this human world. So how do we submit to God? Submission is an act of the will. It is saying, not my will, but thine be done. God, you are in control. My will is gone. I only want yours. And the second thing James tells us, and this comes from verse 8, is to draw near to God. How do we do this? How do we draw near to God? By confessing our sins and asking for his cleansing. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. The Greek word purify means to make chaste. To make chaste is to make virginal again in, in the sexual sense. And this parallels the idea of spiritual adultery in James 4, 4. We're married to Christ, and when we do not submit ourselves to God, we are cheating on him in, in a bodily, in a fleshly way. God graciously draws near to us when we deal with the sin in our lives that keep him at a distance. He will not share us with anyone else. He must have complete control. The double-minded Christian can never be close to God. And the final thing we need to do, the third thing that we need to do to make peace is simply to humble yourselves before God. It is possible to submit outwardly and yet not be humbled inwardly. We have a tendency to, to treat sin too lightly, even laugh about it, which we see in these verses. But sin is serious, and one mark of true humility is facing the seriousness of sin and dealing with our disobedience. And here Wearsby quotes Psalms 51, 17 to kind of show us what does humbling ourselves before God look like? It looks like this. A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. The Lord loves those who humble themselves and give their broken and contrite heart to him. In Psalms 34, 18, we, we see similar imagery. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of broken heart, and save of such as be of a contrite spirit. When we break down, when we bring our sin to God, and when we bring our wars to God and say, 
I can't do this. He accepts them. That's what he wants. If we obey these three instructions to submit to God, to draw near to God, and to humble ourselves before God, then God will draw near us, cleanse us, and forgive us, and the wars will cease. We will not be at war with God, so we will not be at war with ourselves. This means we will not be at war with others. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. And that's from Isaiah 32, 17. So, I hope it hasn't bothered you guys that I've read so much. I don't want to pretend for a second like I have the wisdom that is demonstrated in this in my own head. But the way that we learn is through reading, so that's what you get. (laughs) Um, He has questions at the end of his chapter, and I'm going to go through six of them today rather than doing all ten. And then I'll take a little while to kind of describe my own thoughts on these things. So the first question is, what are some of the reasons Christians war against each other today? What are some of the reasons Christians war against each other today? And when I thought about this earlier, two two things jumped into my mind. I think jealousy. Jealousy is a big part of why Christians war with each other today. Um, In this moment we have, where a lot of us are still at home, and a lot of churches are still not open, and we can... We can jump on Facebook and watch all the services that are happening at all the different churches that we don't go to. And as a minister, and as a member, because I'm both, I can look at those other things and go, man, why isn't my church like that? Why don't we have a nice microphone? Why don't we have, you know, better uh, cameras? Why don't we have a beautiful building? Why don't we have clean carpeting? Why don't we have 10,000 people? And rather than submitting myself to God and accepting what we have and loving it, we can become jealous of those other things. That same jealousy can then go into our personal lives and we can go directly against what he's talked about in two, about the rich and the poor. And we can start to become jealous of those that we think have it better on earth than we do. And then not see them as being faithful or in the light of Christ in the same way as us because we desire what they have. And I think that makes this really hard. So what are some of the reasons Christians are at war against each other today? I think jealousy is one. And I think the second one is internal pain. We feel like no one understands us. And we feel like everyone is judging us. And as a result of those things, we have a hard time turning to other people in an open and loving way and seeking the forgiveness that God has promised us. Um, Instead of doing that, we draw back. We pull away from people. So why does, what, why does Wearsby say that the essence of sin is selfishness? Why is the essence of sin selfishness? So if you go back to what I said probably 15 minutes ago now when I was reading from this, um, when we decide that we want to live in the world, that we want to love the world, we have decided essentially that we don't want to follow God. We want to follow ourselves. And we make ourself into God. And when we make ourself into God, then there's no humility. We are worshiping ourselves. The most intense form of selfishness then is this, the idea that everything you do is right and everyone else is wrong. And when you believe that, then you don't see the little minute examples of selfishness that I think we think of most of the time. When you're a little kid, you're told that being selfish is taking the last bit of food. You know, maybe everybody had the same amount, but you grab a little more. You're being selfish because you're not sharing appropriately. Truly selfish people don't even notice when they're doing those little things like that. They think it isn't wrong because they've earned it or they deserve it. Or since they see themselves in this godly light, it was theirs to begin with. So other people are being selfish by trying to take it away from them. And I think that, that is how selfishness comes into our lives. How can I relate to this personally? Everyone can relate to this personally. (laughs) Um... It's very hard to not pass judgment on others when you see them doing things that you do not agree with. And I think one of the reasons that um, Buddy and I and the other elders have been spending so much time on discernment is that the idea of spiritual discernment is to let go of your internal biases and, and beg God to make you impartial. To say, God, I know what I think, but I don't want to think anymore. I want you to fill my head and my heart with what you desire. And the only way to remove that selfishness from our own, our own lives is to do that, to approach God and say, I cannot, I cannot do it on my own. Do it for me. And he will, because he already is. So in my own life, how have I been selfish? A million ways. I'm sure that I have taken the last drink when somebody else was thirstier. 
I'm sure that I have thought my pain was worse than everyone's around me when that was only in my own mind. So how is it possible to spiritually rationalize our quarrels with other Christians? It's the next question. How is it possible to spiritually rationalize our quarrels with other Christians? To put it in different words. How is it possible that we can take our fights with Christians and say, no, this is what God wants us to do? I've been a part of several churches in my life um, where they believed they were the only correct ones and that nobody else had interpreted the Bible correctly and therefore everyone outside of that building was damned to hell. And, and in fact, some of the people inside the building were damned to hell, um, which always led me to wonder who was it. And I think that we've spiritually rationalized this. We believe that we are following God, but we're not doing that discernment thing I was talking about a minute ago. We're not emptying ourselves of our own desires and our own beliefs. We are saying, God, confirm my desires and my beliefs. And when we're just sitting around for God to tell us we are right, then we'll start telling other people they are wrong. And I think that's how we can do this. And I've known plenty of Christians who absolutely 100% believed that they were completely correct and there would be no yielding and there would be no praying and there would be no attempts at understanding and there would be no loving their neighbor. It would all be their own righteous justification and nothing else. Am I guilty of this? Absolutely, I'm guilty of this. But I want us all to look inwardly and, and kind of see how we've been guilty of this. Because the next question that Wearsby asked is, how can you pray wrongly? I think what he wants us to say is, I can say, Lord, please give me a new Mercedes. I really want it. I'll, I'll pick up people and drive them to church in it. And, and we can see in that cheesy example that we're praying for a selfish thing that we will use to our own pleasure, not to build God's kingdom. And we might justify it by saying we will use it to build God's kingdom. Listen, I don't think having that Mercedes is wrong. But how can a Christian pray wrongly? When you have thrown out God's will, when you have not submitted to God, when you are not looking to the light of Christ, when you are only looking at your own truth, then your prayers will be based on filling your own selfish needs, not on fulfilling God's purpose. And I think that's kind of a tough thing to think about. When our relationship is broken, our prayers will be broken as well. God calls us to be cleansed and forgiven of our sins. And when we do that, we can pray humbly, humbly and openly. But we have to make sure that we are those things. Or it is very possible that we will pray wrongly. We will sit there and say, oh Lord, destroy these hypocritical fools who are all around us. <laughs> Without realizing that we're one of them as well. So the next question is, why do you think Wearsby states that the first two wars with each other and with ourselves are really caused by a third war, a war against God? Well, the truth of it is, if we're not at war with God, if we're humbly submitting as we are supposed to, then we won't be at war with ourselves because there will be no self. And we won't be at war with each other because we will love our neighbors as ourselves. If there's no internal me fighting against God, if, if what's in me if what I am is a vessel for God's will, and I love my neighbor as myself, then I will see them also as a vessel of God's will. And we together then are what Jesus was talking about in those verses I read from John. We will be one. We will be together a vessel for God's will. God cannot be at war against himself. And that's really the only way we can do this. When we submit, when we humble, when we ask, and when we're forgiven, and when we dwell inside of him, then our will is joined with his will, and with all those others that have his will inside of them. That's the only way we can avoid this. So how do people declare war against God? Not your will, but mine be done, Lord. And that's enough. Even if we don't realize we're doing it. So why do you think it is often easy for Christians to be drawn into friendship with the world? There's a lot of people on earth that are not praying for God's will to be done. There's some, obviously, there's people, there's atheists, there's agnostics, there's people who don't believe in God at all. And then there's people that are close to us that we love because God loves them who don't have any desire to be in God's spirit and to follow him um, as he wants to be followed. And we see them and, and then that human jealousy I was talking about earlier comes back. And to alleviate the pain that comes from jealousy, we just give in and we submit to them. We submit to the person who promises us these greater things that we could have. And I think that causes us to be at war each other and with ourselves and it all goes back to that we just haven't submitted to God like we're supposed to which is the subject heading for this section 
So once again, I have talked for 30 minutes about a paragraph. <laughs> when you guys hired an English teacher, I hope you realized that I was capable of doing this. Um, my background is in linguistics and rhetoric and of the critical breaking down of texts, and this is what you do. You read a poem or you read a piece of literature and then you talk about it forever. Um, we used to use this poem, it's called The Red Wheelbarrow. It's by William Carlos Williams. And the Red Wheelbarrow by William Carlos Williams. I want you to Google that and then read it because I don't have it memorized. It's one sentence long, but I have watched teachers teach an entire hour on that one sentence. So if that's what you hired, that's what you get. I hope you don't mind 30 minutes on me talking about this. Um, I want to thank you guys again for joining me in this study. It's been very edifying for me personally, and I encourage you all to do this. When you read something, how do you know that you're not just reading it? You're not just looking at the words and then looking away. I think God wants us to more deeply digest the words. Um, Sarah, since you're here and I see your name, I think about Tim spending a lot of time several years ago talking about eating the word. What does it really mean to devour the word? Well, when you devour it, it becomes part of you. And, and in kind of a really ancient way, it leads us to this thing called contemplation, where we spend a bunch of time dwelling on the word of God and trying to see how it works in our life. And that dwelling on the word of God, that contemplation is really a type of prayer where we're saying, God, I want to understand you. Open my heart. Make me silent so that I can see that. And so this study has been huge for me because I am dwelling on and contemplating the words of James. Try to do it yourself. It will draw you closer to God. Friends, I hope and pray that we can be back together in person as soon as possible. We have to submit ourselves to God and understand that this is outside of us. And hopefully we can exist in it to the glory of him. Thanks for joining me this morning. If you need someone to talk to, give me a call. I am literally just sitting on my couch. <laughs> um, I will see all of you later. Bye.